So um, the most important thing to realize, and as you'll see as we go through the talk tonight, is that melanoma, the diagnosis and the treatment, really requires a, a multidisciplinary approach. So um, the first person usually that you'll end up seeing after um, discovering a primary melanoma or a lesion of concern would be the dermatologist. And as Dr. Leventhal described, once you have found a lesion and it's determined to be a melanoma based on a pathologist's reading of your biopsy, um, the pathologist will give us back certain information that's very important to understand what your risk is of the melanoma coming back and also will help to find what kind of surgery you end up needing. So after you get your um, biopsy report back, um, you will see one of the surgeons. And then after you've had um, an excision um, with or without a sentinel lymph node biopsy, you will end up seeing one of the medical oncologists. And a lot of times I find people can be confused um, that they're seeing a medical oncologist after they've had surgery. While surgery can be curative, and in many cases is, especially in um, early cases of melanoma, it's not always curative and there's always a risk that the melanoma can come back. And that's why you see a medical oncologist. So um, my patients always have a lot of the same questions and I always encourage people, if you're gonna be seeing an oncologist, you wanna think of a few key questions. So one is, what is my personal risk of melanoma recurrence? Um, what can I do to reduce my risk of recurrence? And what should I be looking for and how should I be followed? So that's what I'm gonna to try to answer in the next few minutes. Um, so melanoma is a very small percentage of the, the total cancer cases in the United States. It's really only about 5%. Um, there are over 96,000 cases that are going to be new melanoma cases this year in the United States. And this year, over 7,000 people will die of melanoma. Um, the good news is that most melanomas are diagnosed at an early stage, and often if you have surgery for that, um, there, it can be curative. So the majority of cases present early. Um, less cases present um, with spread to a lymph node, which would be like a stage three disease or what we call regional disease, and then even fewer cases present a metastatic a diagnosis. Um, most me melanoma can occur in any age group. It's very uncommon in um, young children, um, but it can, it mostly occurs in the age range between 55 and 75 with a median age of around 65. So what do we mean by surveillance and what's the purpose of that? So we want to identify treatable melanoma recurrences sooner than would be found without um, the patient undergoing an active surveillance program. And we determine what the risk is, what your risk of recurrence is, and what your risk of survival is based upon um, the staging system by the American Joint uh, Committee on Cancer, so the AJCC you might have heard of. So while we use that system, which I'm gonna just walk you through and understand what your risk is of recurrence, um, that's a very, that, that is an imperfect system. So while it gives you a broad overview statistically of what your risk could be, we treat each patient very individually based on what we understand their risk to be. Um, so a stage one melanoma, um, and so again, um, Melanoma, we look for a few, a few features that are very important to help us determine risk. One is thickness of the tumor, which is measured in millimeters. And the second thing is ulceration, um, which is if the top layer of the epidermis is sort of effaced and that's a pathological diagnosis. So a stage one melanoma typically is no more than two millimeters. And depending on if you get staged, you know, these are all kind of subclassified, a 1A or a 1B, um, whether or not you have ulceration or not can put you into a different stage. And the risk of recurrence, and when I say recurrence, I mean either the melanoma coming back at or around the scar site, coming back in a regional lymph node, or coming back somewhere else distantly in the body. The risk for people who have a stage one melanoma of recurrence over time is at most about five to 10%. The unfortunate thing is we don't have any better tools to identify who the patients are who are in that small group. So that's why we, but that's why we emphasize the importance of surveillance. Um, so a stage two, there are actually three different types of stage two melanomas, ranging um, all the way between one and four millimeters, plus or minus ulceration, with a stage two C, which is the highest level, being larger than four millimeters with ulceration. And the risk here is very variable, depending on what stage two you are, a risk of between 15 to 40% recurrence. A stage three would be if you had a primary melanoma, for example, here that started on the left thigh, that then spreads to the regional lymph node in the left groin. 
Um, and stage three is extremely variable in terms of risk of recurrence, probably between anywhere from a 40 to 80 or even 90% risk of recurrence. Um, and so the, it, the melanoma staging system is actually very intricate and your risk is determined based on that. So it's very important you do see an oncologist who can walk you through what your risk is and what your options are to reduce your risk. This is just to show you the complexity of the staging. We take on the left side the end staging and on the top the T staging, which is the tumor characteristics, end staging is the nodal characteristics, and we come up with a stage three. And you can see based on the stage three type that you have, A, B, C, or D, the survival is um, very variable. So if you have an early stage three, there's actually a pretty good prognosis even 10 years out for people surviving. Whereas unfortunately with um, much later stages, the survival becomes worse and worse. The good news is, is that now there's a lot of treatment out there that we can offer patients to help reduce the, um, their risk after they've been diagnosed with a stage three melanoma. And then stage four is just where the melanoma has spread distantly away from the primary site. And melanoma really can go anywhere. Um, and I emphasize that it can go anywhere. So um, that's the importance of surveillance, which I'm going to talk to you about the methods we use. So um, I always advise my patients, if you see something, say something and call us. Um, even the, the pictures that I have here are some examples of some local recurrences and in-transit recurrences in and around SCAR sites. So you can see the black dots or in transit, you can see some nodules in and around the SCAR site, and they all look very different. And these are more kind of dramatic recurrences. There can also be more subtle recurrences. And the earlier it's detected, the, the quicker we can act to treat it, whether through surgery plus or minus what we call adjuvant therapy. Um, so after resection, what is the time period in which melanoma recurs? The peak recurrences are typically in year one, and about 50% of cases um, occur then, particularly in the skin and lymph node. In year two, another 30%. And then distant metastases tend to peak later, but really, again, they can occur at any time. And then late recurrences occur, but they're uncommon. So in certain series, maybe only five or 6% of patients um, had had a late recurrence at five years and even less at 10 years. So based on that evidence, um, post-operative surveillance is really recommended and the standard of care is pretty much five years out from your diagnosis that you would be followed. But because the risk never falls to zero, um, we always recommend that even if you're 10 years out or longer, if there is a suspicion, you really should have a workup. Recurrences are detected, actually up to 50% of cases are detected by the patients themselves. So it's important that you are mindful of your scar site, that you're mindful of your lymph node areas. And then again, if you see something, you say something and report it and um, come in to be examined. Um, Physicians also frequently will detect recurrences, mostly by physical exam, less so in a patient who's asymptomatic and is having routine imaging, but we do pick it up there as well, and then very rarely from laboratory testing. <clears throat> so the, the take home um, is that we can employ meaningful interventions if um, we find the recurrent or metastatic disease, which is again the importance of surveillance. So when to, who do we image and when do we image? Um, Im the decision to image is really based upon your risk factors um, and your stage. So it's also balanced by the risk of radiation exposure um, and by the potential of identifying false positives. So we tend to image people who we think really do have a significant risk of recurrence. And then if we were to find that recurrence, we could treat that and hopefully prevent um, further morbidity or mortality. Um, and I, I give an example just of what the radiation dose you get and the relative lifetime cancer risk is, because I know a lot of people always ask me this. So we all get radiation exposure just from the environment over time, and it's measured in something called millisievers. And so typically in a year, you would get three millisievers worth of radiation. A CAT scan could be anywhere from 10 to 20 millisievers. <clears throat> And a PET scan is usually more than that, up to 25. And it all it's all very variable depending on what the technique the radiologist uses. But for a CAT scan, for someone getting maybe a CAT scan between one to three times per year per 10 years, your risk of lifetime cancer could go up by a little over 1%. And for annual PET scans, let's say it could go up a little higher. And again, these numbers are really variable, but we take we we do balance that risk but we'll take the risk if we think that your risk of melanoma recurring is higher than that which often it is <clears throat> 
Um, so who gets imaged? Um, so typically patients with higher stage two disease and stage three disease will be followed with imaging several times a year. And I'll review that schedule right at the end. Um, there's no role for imaging in stage one patients because the risk of it coming back is really quite low. Um, and uh, so unless they're symptomatic or we have a concern, typically we won't do full body imaging for stage one patients. So there's multiple imaging modalities that we'll use for surveillance. In stage one patients who are not going to be getting CAT scans or PET scans, if they have you know, a higher risk stage one, often we'll do a chest x-ray <clears throat> for the first few years, but typically that has a low rate of detecting an abnormality. Um, then typically for patients, again, with stage two or stage three disease, we'll do either CAT scans or PET scans. Um, so, and just to, CAT scans, um, a PET scan is really like a, pet, a, a CAT scan with, um, you get injected with radio label glucose and then the, that picks up areas and it lights up areas where you have either inflammation, cancer, or infection. And so um, whether to do a, a PET scan or a CAT scan can be um, really determined by your physician based upon your risk and what we're looking for. Um, the pros of PET scan are that they can often detect occult metastases and they have whole body coverage. Um, whereas CAT scans don't have whole body coverage. So it often also depends on the site of where your melanoma is. Um, on PET CT, we often will see false positives, but you can see that on CAT scan as well. It's more expensive, has a little bit more radiation, and has limited ability to find brain metastases or small lesions. Um, brain MRI, so there are no clear guidelines for brain MRI um, for surveillance, but it should always be performed in stage four melanoma and also if you're symptomatic. And then abdominal MRI is used in select cases. Um, for laboratory testing, we do do it, but again, as I mentioned, it rarely detects melanoma recurrence. Um, so we do a comprehensive metabolic panel, a complete blood count, and an LDH, which is a lactate dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme that can be a sign of tissue damage. And so it has a low sensitivity for finding um, melanoma recurrences. So there are patients with advanced melanoma who have a normal LDH, and there are patients who also have an elevated LDH. But just because you have an elevated LDH doesn't necessarily mean you have a melanoma recurrence. So LDH is not used um, as a single marker to detect melanoma recurrence. And then as Dr. Leventhal mentioned, um, for patients who, who are at risk for melanoma, but also patients who have melanoma, we recommend lifetime dermatologic surveillance. Um, you have up to a 5 to 10% chance, once you've had one primary melanoma, of developing a second primary melanoma. And that can develop really at any point. Um, but the ultimate prognosis for you will be based on what your thickest melanoma was, so the melanoma that had the highest risk factors. And then we always um, advocate for safe sun practices, as Dr. Leventhal mentioned. Um, and then how can you reduce your risk of recurrence? And this is going to be discussed in a later talk. But now we're lucky enough to have all kinds of what we call adjuvant therapy, which is therapy we give after surgery in order to try to reduce your risk. And we have that with immunotherapy, such as nivolumab or pembrolizumab, and also with targeted therapy if you have a BRAF mutation. And that's something else that you'll discuss with your oncologist um, if you see them uh, for surveillance. Um, and then, of course, at Yale, we have the benefit of having ongoing clinical trials. So um, more and more, there's an opportunity for people who are getting adjuvant therapy to um, participate in trials that incorporate both the standard of care therapy with maybe an experimental therapy. And then lastly, um, so what is the follow-up schedule that we follow? Um, it varies among countries, um, institutions, individual clinicians. We try to make things as standardized as possible, but um, active surveillance after surgery is really the standard of care for anyone who's had a, a primary melanoma that's been resected. So for stage one, typically you would see us one to two times per year. Um, we do do blood work. And if you're at higher risk, we might do a chest x-ray once a year. And you, you, your follow-up duration would be about five years. Um, for stage two, you would have a physical exam about two to three times per year with blood work and imaging one to two times per year to look for uh, recurrences or metastatic disease. And you would do that for at least five years. And then for patients with stage three disease, you would be examined two to four times per year with blood work and with imaging at about two times a year for at least five years. Um, after five years, you may be discharged from clinic or depending on your risk, you might be followed a little bit further after that, maybe annually.
And the take home point is really, if you see something, say something, because um, effective treatment can be offered if a recurrence or distant metastatic disease is detected. Thank you.